Father, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would help each one of us here today individually get past a business as usual mentality, that we would not be worried about the time, that we would not be worried about what's for lunch, that we would not be worried about other things, but we would be completely focused on encountering and embracing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, if you don't show up today and minister to us, then we've wasted our time. Holy Spirit, move, I pray. And we submit to you, Lord, in your Holy Spirit to do whatever you want to do here with us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. is asking you this morning I'm not asking the Lord is asking you this morning to allow him to encounter you are you ready for that are you ready for that are you willing to have a meeting with Jesus? Are you willing to say, Lord, I'll listen? Are you willing to say, Lord, here I am. You see everything, you see everything that's inside of me. You see all the brokenness. You see all the pain. You see all of it, Lord. But nonetheless, I'm willing to meet with you. Nonetheless, I'm willing to listen to you. Nonetheless, I'm willing to allow you to embrace me this morning. When you've built up walls in your life and you've pushed back because rejection and hurt and pain, let, allow the Lord to just move those walls and come in and wrap his arms around you this morning. You know, he's good at that. You know, he's good See, th this is what we do in our lives through rejection and hurt and pain. We start constructing brick and mortar walls to protect ourselves. But Jesus wants to tear those walls down. And he wants to meet you in an intimate place. He wants to become intimate with us. He wants to go past surface and become intimate with us in the heart. And until we embrace that, until we understand that, we're going to continue to operate in the surface. And we're going to continue to be plagued in our spirit by the things that we're struggling with. Last week, I spoke on the seed of rejection. Seed of rejection. I want to take a second this morning and to recap a few things that we discussed because it's going to lead us into what God wants to do this morning. If you remember, we started off last week with a video of a dandelion and we saw the wind come and hit that dandelion and blow the seeds. And we saw those seeds. We've all done it. We've all picked, 
picked a dandelion. We've all blown it, and we've all seen those seeds fly in the wind, and those seeds, the wind will carry it a good distance. And wherever that seed, if that seed lands on soil, what are you going to get? You're going to get another dandelion. We use the analogy of how seeds of rejection are deposited into our spirits by the words and actions of other people. Listen to me very carefully. We have many people, many teenagers, many teenagers that become adults that are walking around carrying rejection in their life by, from a seed that was planted by their mother or their father, that seed of rejection. And instead of rejecting that rejection, you allow that seed to be planted in your spirit and it began to grow. And because of that, you're struggling with rejection in your life. Maybe it wasn't your mom or your dad. Maybe it was someone else. Maybe someone else spoke a word of rejection into your life. Maybe someone else did an action that planted a seed of rejection in your life. And we talked in detail last week about how these seeds of rejection if it, they're, they're gonna be they're, they're out there they're flowing they're flowing from words they're flowing from actions and they're they're trying to find a place into our heart they're trying to land in the soil of our heart and we have to make a decision of either rejecting the rejection or allowing that seed to land and begin to produce fruit of rejection. And we went over a list of uh, fruit of rejection or manifestations of rejection, if you will, last week. I shared with you about at a, in a time of prayer, intimate time with prayer, I saw in the spirit realm a man who had a spirit of rejection piggybacking on his back. And he wanted to go in one direction, but the spirit had a rein and a bit in his mouth. And he wanted to go straight, but the spirit of rejection that was piggybacking him was dictating the direction in which he went. If you were not here last week, or you weren't able to see this uh, message on the seed of rejection and you want to see it I want to invite you to either go to our Facebook page or our website and you it's posted online but I share the recap of last week's message on the seed of rejection because it's going to lead us into what the Lord wants to speak to us today last I believe it was Sunday night uh, a week ago I received an email from someone and uh, even though I'm not going to reveal their identity to you today, I did ask this person for permission to share a little bit about this email that I received. But this person uh, sent me an email saying that the Lord ministered to them through this word about the seed of rejection. And they, they talked about how they had wrestled with a spirit of rejection most of their life. That they recognized that seeds were planted, the seed of rejection was planted in their life as a child through circumstances of their upbringing and, and how God had delivered them from a spirit of rejection, taught them how to reject the rejection, but also admitted that there are times that even though that they know how to reject rejection, there are still times where the rejection, they, they still wrestle with it. You understand? See, you, just because you reject rejection once doesn't mean that a spirit of rejection won't come against you again. It's an ongoing process that we have to learn to do on a regular basis. But one of the things that this individual said is that they said, I, I believe that the next step of once you learn how to reject rejection and those who have rejected you, that the next step that is so crucial is you have to learn how to forgive those who have rejected you. It's one thing to say, I'm not going to receive that rejection. But many of us have received that rejection. And because the seed was planted and it began to grow and it began to produce or manifest things in our life, 
that weren't good and that pain and that hurt was there, we began to build up a hatred towards the person who planted the seed of rejection. Well, hate's a strong word, I know. So I want to talk to us this morning about the fruit of unforgiveness, specifically from a seed of rejection which was planted in your life that you allowed to begin to grow. The fruit of unforgiveness. It's one thing to say, Olivia, I forgive you. Anybody can verbalize and say, I forgive you. Now, she hasn't done anything wrong. I'm just using this as an example. It's one thing for me to say, Olivia, I forgive you. You're my sister in the Lord. I forgive you. It's easy to say that. But it's also easy to say that and turn around and walk away still having unforgiveness in your heart, still having a little bit of vengeance in your heart. See, I love you, sister. I forgive you. I forgive you. Man, I just can't wait till she gets it. Lord, pay her back. May the fleas and ticks of a thousand camels infest her armpits. Whatever it is you want to say. See, it's, it's, it's one thing to say, I forgive you. That's the easy part. Right? But here's the, here's the thing. God sees into your heart. And he knows the feelings that you still carry, even though you have verbalized the words, I forgive you. That I forgive you doesn't mean anything if it's not meant from the heart. You can fool me and I can fool you, but you cannot fool God. I can fool Olivia and make her think that I have truthfully forgiven her. Some of us are Academy Award winning actors and actresses. I mean, some of us can go right up against the best of them, couldn't we? I mean, we can walk the red carpet next to the biggest star out there. We may not look as good as them, but we can act just as good, if not better. Church folk are good actors. Boy, we're good actors. We say one thing, but we do another. Are y'all ready for this? See, rejection equals hurt. And if we're not careful, hurt equals hate. And if we're not careful, hate equals unforgiveness. A lot of people say, well, I, you know, I don't like that word hate. It's really strong. I don't hate anybody. Okay. Okay. Oh, you just that good, huh? You just that spiritual. Oh, I never use the word hate. Okay. Give me a break. Oh, pastor, why are you, why are you using the word hate? Oh, I don't hate nobody. Okay. See, here's the thing. Many times we are rejected by the people that we're the closest to. And man, that caused hurt and pain. We're rejected sometimes by our family. Sometimes we're rejected by our closest friends. And it, it creates a hurt. And if we're not careful, it can create a hatred. A hatred. And a, 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 I don't like them. And we have to understand that when we, it is a choice not to forgive somebody. You make the choice. We make the choice. I am choosing that I'm not going to forgive. That's a choice, folks. 
That's a choice. I want to read a statement that I, I saw this week as I was looking over this. It says, unforgiveness is choosing, choosing to stay trapped in a cell of bitterness serving time for someone else's crime. I'm going to read that again. Unforgiveness is choosing. We're making a choice to stay trapped in a cell of bitterness Serving time for someone else's crime. And we do that all the time. In the spirit realm when it comes to forgiveness. How many of you, if I, if I went out here today and I committed a heinous crime. Let's just say I went into a store with a gun and I robbed them at gunpoint and I stole their money. And I was convicted in a jury and I was sentenced to spend 25 years in prison, how many of you in here would say, you know what, I love that dude so much, I'm going to serve the time for him. Sign me up, take, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in, and I'll serve his time instead of him doing it. I, I love him that much. None of you would do that. Right? But we, we voluntarily serve time in prison because someone else's crime, because someone else hurt us, because someone else rejected us, because someone else sowed a seed of rejection that we didn't reject, we received it, and we allowed it to be, begin to grow, and we allowed the fruit of it, the bitterness of it, to come into our lives and, and start manifesting itself. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some I'm gonna give you some fruits this morning of unforgiveness. All right. If you re don't you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to do nothing. If you recognize some of these fruits in your life, you may be dealing with unforgiveness. All right. Number one, bursts of anger. Do I need to go any farther? if you have unforgiveness in your life you will also struggle with a lot of anger in your life sometimes that anger will be taken out on the people that you love the most because the people you love the most are the ones generally you're around the most right why are you, when, when you get rejected you become hurt and sometimes you become angry. Boy, y'all ain't listening. Y'all, it, it's quiet in here today. <clears throat> if you find yourself on a regular basis being angry all the time, there's a good possibility that you have fruit of unforgiveness in your life. See, a lot of times we have unforgiveness that we've buried and we've packed it away. It, it was so long ago, but we're still, we're still toting it everywhere that we go. And it's so easy to forget about, you know, hey, you, you know what I'm saying? It's so easy, oh, that was a long time ago, but you know what? You never truly forgave that person and the fruit of that unforgiveness is still in you. Maybe, maybe you're angry and you don't even know why you're angry. You ever been like that before? Why am I so angry? Why am I, why am I angry all the time? It's a possibility that you have a fruit of unforgiveness in your life. Number two, you keep a list of offenses. Let's see here. Yep, on June 27th, 1984, at 2.13 p.m., so-and-so hurt me. And the Lord is saying, let it go, but you haven't let it go. What does the scripture say? That love keeps no records of wrong. If you constantly keep a list of offenses in your mind, you are struggling with the fruit of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. 
if your go-to line every time you're in an argue with somebody, argument with somebody, maybe your spouse or your, your, your kid or your mom or your dad, if your go-to line is always bringing that ace out of your back pocket and say, well, you did this, there's a possibility that you might have some fruit of unforgiveness. Because when you've forgiven somebody, you don't always throw it in their face. When you've truly let it go, if Stephen has hurt me, and I've truly let it go, I'm not going to continue to remind him what he did to me. Because love keeps no record of wrong. Number three. I'm going to have to really explain this one. You hate yourself or your offender. You know that there are people walking around and I'm getting a little ahead of myself and we're going to get into this a little bit more later but you know that there are people walking around that hate themselves so much because of the actions that they've done in their life and they're not even able to forgive themselves. See, we're going to talk about that this morning. Forgiving your offender and being able to forgive yourself. If you have hate in your life, that there's a good possibility that there's some, some unforgiveness. If you, have, if, if you can see an individual and you can feel it boiling up inside of you, I ain't getting no amens. But I ain't wanting none neither. You know what I'm talking about? We've all been there before where that person's hurt us, rejected us, done us wrong. And all of a sudden, they come walking in the room with that big smile on their face. And you're saying, oh, I wish I could just slap that right off of their... (laughs) None of y'all have done that, I know. Number four, you replay the offense over and over in your mind. When you have forgiven somebody from the heart, you don't continue to replay the offense over and over in your mind. It's done, it's over. When you're laying in bed and you're staring at the, ce- uh, the ceiling and your mind is constantly replaying the offense over and over and over again, you haven't forgiven When you're laying in bed and you're replaying over and over and over again the rejection over and over and over and over again, you haven't rejected the rejection. You've received the seed planted in your spirit. At number five, there's a clog in your spiritual drain because the scripture tells us that when we have not forgiven those who have sinned against us, our Heavenly Father does not forgive us of our sin. And I don't know about you guys, but, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul told us that we have to die daily. Like, I, you know, I, I died yesterday. Sometime throughout the day today, I'm going to have to die again because I just ain't that good. And, you know, but when, when, we, when we have unforgiveness in our heart, when we have bitterness in our heart, there's a clog in your spiritual drain. And we're walking around with all this sin building up inside of us because we haven't forgiven the person who offended us. And the Lord is just saying, hey, look, I'm just waiting. When you're ready, when you're ready, I'm waiting. But in the meantime... The clog is, 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 is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know what I'm saying? Do y'all hear me this morning? See, we have to learn how to let it go. Let it go. Give it to God. God, this is yours. I know they rejected me. I know that they violated me. I know that they hurt me. I know that they did me wrong, and and I didn't deserve that. I know that, but Lord, I'm giving it to you.
We're talking about first forgiving our offender. And then I'm going to talk just for a second about forgiving ourselves. You know, you can find copious amounts of scriptures in the Bible that talk about forgiveness. Jesus talked in great detail about forgiveness. And I love the story in Matthew chapter 18 where he talks about the parable of the unmerciful servant. We started off uh, with this in verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? You know what? I love Peter's, I, I love Peter's question here. Because really, if you look into Peter's mind, he's, there, something in his mind is, he asked that question because he wants to know where's the cutoff point. You hear me? Peter wanted to know, hey, this dude, when can I cut this dude off and say, you get no more forgiveness? You've hurt me too many times, you get no more. The, see, there was, a, there was a reason why Peter asked that question. He was waiting for an answer to say, when can I cut this person off and no longer forgive them? But Jesus came back as he does so good and says, Peter, it don't work like that, my brother. I know you're looking for me to say, Peter, after seven times, you're good. You don't have to forgive him no more. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, no, Peter, there's no limit to forgiveness. There's no limit to it. He gives this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to the king. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and, listen, here's the key word, canceled the debt. Didn't say, I'm going to give you some more time. He canceled the debt. Oh, and by the way, Jesus exaggerated this story so much to, for the, for Peter to understand because this talent that he says, he says uh, he owed the master 10,000 talents. Once I was doing a study about talents and the measure and, and the money and all this other stuff, in the entire city of Galilee, if you collected all the money and all the revenue, to everybody brought every, every ounce of currency that in the entire town, it would accumulate about 300 talents. But yet the man owed 10,000. This was a debt that could never, ever be repaid. I, I taught on this probably about a year ago, and I broke it down to what a day's wage was, and I didn't bring those notes with me. But I, it was some, I mean, it would have, there was no way in this lifetime that this guy could have even paid a quarter of the debt off, much less the entire debt. If I, if I borrowed 20 bucks from Marcia, you know, I could pay that back. But see, Jesus was making his point that this servant owed a debt that could never, ever be repaid. But yet his master took pity on him and canceled the debt. You don't owe it anymore. You know something? We don't think about the weight of this. Because we, we like to think in the, in the we, we, many times we like to think in the natural. If I came in here today and, 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 and I said, I, I just picked someone out in the crowd and I said, I want to pay all of your debt off. Your house, your credit cards, your car, Every, every, you add up all the debt that you have and you give it to me and I'm going to write you a check right now. I'm telling you, boy, there'd be some dancing going on. There'd be some, you know, some, some partying, some, some, some happiness. 
some moonwalks. In the words of Trinity, she would feel dope, by the way. That, that, that's, that's slang for, man, this is cool. All right, I know a lot of y'all was like, dope? What? I know a lot of y'all was struggling with that. I, I wanted to break that down for you, okay? Dope. Why is that dope? And we know how the story goes because this same man who was forgiven of so much goes out and finds somebody that owes him a penny and has him thrown in prison until he can pay it back. You remember what Jesus says? Somebody sees him throw that man in jail because he owed him a small amount of money. And it says, then the master, verse 32, then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have taken mercy on your fellow servant just as I've had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This, look, I, 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 didn't, write, I didn't make this up. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from the what? the heart he didn't say this is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive someone from the mouth he said this is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brothers from the heart the mouth means nothing it's the heart Colossians 3 and 13 tells us what it says it right here. We're going to put it up on the screen. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. God is teaching us. <clears throat> you forgive, I forgive. From the heart, you forgive, I forgive. I forgive from the heart. God is saying, I forgive from the heart. But what happens is, is when we have been rejected and we've been hurt and that seed is there and we don't allow the forgiveness from the heart there becomes a clog in the system where God says okay I see your heart I see that bitterness I see that I see that unforgiveness. I know you told him that you forgave him, but you really didn't because I know your heart. You're a really good actor, by the way. But until you release it, I can't forgive you for what you're doing. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a requirement. We have to forgive others in order for us to get forgiveness. Well, somebody said, well, uh, well I'm good because I don't sin any, so I don't need God to forgive me. Well, you, well that, that's a lie. And number two, if you're holding on to that unforgiveness, that's a sin in itself. We, we could talk for hours on this, but we all understand that, uh, that God says, I want you to let it go. Give it to me. Give it to me. Choosing not to forgive keeps you in a cell of bitterness for someone else's crime. How long are you going to sit there? How long are you going to stay in prison with bitterness and hatred and hurt because of what someone else did? Sometimes the hardest person in the world to forgive is ourself. Because sometimes the only person who knows, other than God, what you've done is us. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever been in a place 
that you've been so disgusted with your actions and your choices that you begin to not like yourself? If that has never happened, you're a 100% narcissist all the time. I mean, if you've never looked at yourself, if you always look at yourself like, hey, this is great. This, look, it does not get any better than this. Lord, thank you for blessing me. I'm just, you know, I'm just that good, you know. Because I think that all of us have looked at ourselves and our actions and we've been disgusted by it. And when we're in that situation where we're disgusted by our actions and we begin to not like ourselves because of our actions, the enemy starts speaking to us and say that God can't use me anymore, that I'm useless, that God is, is I'm defined by my failures. I'm defined by the, the actions that I've been showing. I'm defined by everything that I did that wasn't good. And before too long, you will sit around just completely day after day disgusted with yourself. But in the same way that we have to learn to forgive our offender, we have to learn that when we go to God in repentance with a true heart, as long as we have forgiven others, God says, I will forgive you for what you've done. See, can I, let me just say this. There isn't one of us sitting in here, there's not one person in this world that hasn't ever found themselves in what I call a situation you know what I'm talking about you ever just have you ever just messed up so bad that you find yourself in a situation and you're just like oh this ain't good and 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 you, you know you know what I'm talking about right you ever had anybody you know a friend with you friend of yours or something and you're talking to them and man the conversation's good everything's going good but all of a sudden they ask a question that starts to tiptoe around your situation. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, that ain't none of your business. Landon, come on up here and start playing so I'll start winding down here. God knows that you're going to get yourself in some situations. He knows you are. He knows that I am. God knows that we're going to find ourselves in some situations based on what we've done. We can't blame anybody else. It was our own doing. But God says, as long as you are willing to release and let go and give forgiveness to others for what they've done to you, I will forgive you and I will help you move on and I will take you to bigger and greater things. Can I remind you in closing this morning? Second Samuel, I think it's, I think it's chapter 11. Yes, yeah, Second Samuel chapter 11. We all know this story. <clears throat> You've got King David and you've got a good-looking woman named Bathsheba. Can I remind you this morning that the Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. Can I remind you this morning that David, when all the other fellows were scared to death and shaking in their armor, stood up with boldness and said, Today I will feed your carcass giant to the fowl of the air and he walked out to a battlefield with a slingshot and a stone and he killed and slayed he he that rock hit the giant right in the head then he took the giant sword and cut the giant's head off David was a mighty man of war. He was a man after God's own, uh, own heart. The Bible says that he was the greatest king of Israel but yet David found himself in a situation 
because of his own doing. Bathsheba found herself in a situation because her husband was off to war and she was home alone. And I heard somebody say it like this. I'm not throwing Bathsheba under the bus. But ladies, think about this just for a second, okay? If you're going to go outside and bathe, I think you're going to be familiar with who can see you and who can't see you, right? If there's a rooftop right next to your bathtub, maybe, just maybe, I'm not, I'm not throwing Bathsheba on the bus, but maybe, just maybe, Bathsheba wanted the king to see her. Maybe, just maybe, Bathsheba was lonely, and she knew that the king, I'm, I'm not, ladies, don't take this personal, I'm just saying maybe she knew that the king frequented the rooftop in the evening time. So she's found herself in a situation. King David has found himself in a situation. And here's the go-to thing. When we find ourselves in a situation, most of the time we try and fix it ourselves. Hey, Uriah, come on. I just want to bring you, nobody else, just you. I want to bring you home. I want to let you spend some time with your wife, none of them other guys, but I'm going to let you come home, spend some time, some, you know, at, you know and, and when we try to fix it, it don't work. You know why? Because Uriah was a godly man of character, and he said, as surely as the Lord lives, while my brothers are out in the battlefield, I will not go home and let, lie with my wife. You can't fix the situation. Sometimes we read a story in the Bible and we read it and we don't really, we don't really process it. Can you think about this? Can you think about this? You have a, a womb that has a baby in it that was conceived out of adultery. You have a woman whose husband has been off and when he does come home, he's not willing to go in to his house and be with his wife. There's no way. You know why we don't conceive it as much? is because we live in a society now that that's just par for the course, right? That's par for the course. But back in those days, women were stoned for that. See, this is what I want you to get out of all this. God will deal with us about our sin, and we have to repent. Isn't that what happened? God sent the prophet Nathan to David called him out on the carpet for it. There was a consequence to his sin. Do you remember the story? There's a consequence to the sin. He said, you're going to lose the child that was conceived out of this. And not only that, but what you did in secret, I'm going to do in broad daylight. I'm going to raise someone up from your family who in broad daylight will be with your wives. Flip a few more chapters in this same book and you'll see his son Absalom when they pitch a tent on the rooftop and he goes in with his father's wives what God said was going to happen happened but nonetheless there was a consequence David repented and God says I've forgiven you of your sin and David you still got work to do for me he says to Bathsheba he says look I've forgiven you of your sin and but you but there, I'm still going to use you because the same womb that carried a baby that was conceived out of adultery that same womb carried a king inside a king by the name of Solomon see you may have some junk in your life that was conceived out of a situation and some sin but when we have truly from our heart forgiven others as the Lord has commanded us to, He will forgive us of our situations and He will, he, 
you will be forgiven. I'm not condoning sin. I'm just saying you will be forgiven. God will cleanse you of it, and he will say, I still have work for you to do. your heads with me for a minute. I believe that there are individuals in this small building, in this small gathering that have been struggling with a spirit of rejection. They feel rejected by others, possibly even rejected by God. I also believe that there's some people in here today that are struggling with some unforgiveness towards other people, and they're also struggling with some unforgiveness of themselves. If we could see into the spirit realm right now, I believe that there would be some spirits of rejection that are piggybacking on some of us that dictate our thoughts, our actions, and the direction that we go in. And Jesus is saying to us right now, he's saying, if you would just only get past business as usual, if you would only allow me to wrap my arms around you, if you would only allow me to become intimate with you, if you would only just let your guard down and let me in, if you would only just let me wrap my arms around you, I will heal you of that. I will take it away from you. I want to ask for our elders and their spouses to come forward and just pray with me for a minute pray with me for a minute let's let's just let the Holy Spirit begin to speak to our hearts I want us to take a few minutes to be obedient to the Lord this morning because I believe that the Spirit of the Lord is here and where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty there is freedom And I believe that the Lord really wants to minister to us. I want to close this in a word of prayer. Um, Bow with me, Father. We thank you today for meeting us in this place. We thank you for healing. We thank you for deliverance of rejection. We thank you for unforgiveness being removed from our lives. We thank you for delivering us from the fruit of unforgiveness. We thank you for delivering us from bitterness, from anger. Lord, would you just make us more like you each and every day? Go with us now, Lord. Watch over us, protect us, keep us. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.